Hi everyone. My name is Kinsey New Walker and I work as the director of the Mind Wars Museum, a grassroots institution that educates and preserves a people's history of the Cold Wars. We're located in historic Maitland and we've been around for nine years now. The museum's work is people funded, people powered, people's history. Our work entails a diverse public programming, including tonight's Mind Wars Forum. Our small team works daily to educate and preserve the stories of coal miners and their families, efforts to unionize the Southern coal fields of West Virginia. We preserve and curate artifacts and exhibits both digitally and in person. We provide lesson plans and a growing list of resources for teachers to get this history into their classrooms. And most recently, we've been building monuments in West Virginia for our Courage in the Hollers project. This evening, you are listening to episode four of Mind Wars Forum season four. This year's forum has been made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the council. I'm so excited for tonight's guest, who is Dr. Ann Lawrence. Anne is the author of On Dark and Bloody Ground, an oral history of the West Virginia Mine Wars. This book was published in 2021 by West Virginia University Press in connection with the centennial of the Battle of Blair Mountain. It is based on oral history interviews and collected in 1972 when she was an undergraduate at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. Anne went on to get a doctorate in sociology from the University of California Berkeley, and taught for 30 years on the faculty of San Jose State University in California, a large public university in the Silicon Valley. She has been back to West Virginia several times in the past two years to promote her book and to carry out follow-up research on the West Virginia Mine Wars, which I'll ask her about later. But for now, I want to say welcome, Anne. Kenzie, I'm just so thrilled to be here with you today, and uh, I just can't say enough good things about the work that you and Kirsten and your other colleagues at the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum do, so congratulations. Thank you, and we couldn't do it without um, the work of people like you. Um, you really helped establish you know, a strong foundation for Mine Wars history, Mine Wars scholarship and research, and so I want to get right into it and ask you, what brought you to West Virginia in the early 1970s? So what brought me to West Virginia in 1972? Um, as you mentioned in your intro, I was at the time an undergraduate student at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. I was studying history and sociology. I the, uh, the Oral History Project was funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities um, under a special program that they had at that time called the Youth Grant Program that supported humanities research for young people under the age of 30. And I was not the original grant recipient. Uh, the original grant recipient was the Miner's Voice, which was the newspaper of the Miners for Democracy which was the reform movement in the uh, UMW at that time. And for those of you who remember that labor history, that was when uh, Arnold Miller uh, ran under the Miners for Democracy ticket against uh, Tony Boyle. And he won that election and became the president of the UMW. So um, the Miners Voice had applied for a grant uh, to do this oral history research, um, but by the time the grant came through, uh, they were running a campaign for Arnold Miller for the presidency of the UMW, and they didn't have the staff to carry it out. And uh, by luck, um, one of my close friends from high school was working in the Miners for Democracy campaign, and she said, I think I know someone who could do this for us. And they got in touch with me, and I took a leave of absence from Swarthmore from college, moved to Charleston, and then lived in the coal fields for about six, seven months um, and traveled around in a little compact car with a little portable tape recorder and some cassette tapes and interviewed uh, mostly retired coal miners and their wives about their experiences in the 
early days of unionizing the coal fields um, of central Appalachia. That's so cool. Um, yeah. The interviews are great. You collected them more than 50 years ago. Yes, How I did. And they were recently published. Uh, <laughs> That's a really great question. And most books don't get published 50 years after they are written. Um, I did not publish it at the time. At the time, I wrote a basically a 300 page manuscript, which was um, my oral, the result, you know, my oral history interviews and descriptions of the people I interviewed and so forth. Um, I, at the time, distributed that grant report to libraries <laughs> in West Virginia, um, Kentucky, and, and Virginia, uh, but it wasn't published. Um, over the last few years, I've been working to try to get this work into the public domain. I donated my tape recordings um, to George Washington University Labor History Collection, where they are now archived. And maybe later in the conversation, I'll be able to play you an audio clip from one of those uh, interviews. Um, but I also had extra copies of the grant report. And I thought maybe somebody would be interested in this. So I started searching online for West Virginia mine wars to see if there's anybody out there who <laughs> might still be interested in this. And I was really quite astonished to find the West Virginia mine wars museum, which I had not previously heard of. And uh, a lot of other fantastic activities going on. So I found the email address for Catherine Venable Moore, who serves on the board of the museum. And I wrote her an email and I said, I explained who I was. I said I had extra copies of this grant report, you know, would she by any chance be interested in having a copy for the museum? And she wrote me back about 20 minutes later. And the email went like this. And I can't believe it's you. We've been looking for you. <laughs> well, I didn't know who she was. I was astonished to get that email. I thought, how in the world does she know who I am? And why is she looking for me? Uh, it turns out she had a copy of the report that she had found in a library. And she had the idea that it should be published in connection with the centennial of the Battle of Flare Mountain. Um, and she had apparently been Googling Ann Lawrence. It's a pretty common name. And uh, she couldn't find me. So I kind of appeared out of the blue in her email stream. So we connected. Um, She's, as you know, because you have worked with her, she's a phenomenally well-networked and effective person. And she put me in touch with Derek Krisoff, who's the um, head of the West Virginia University Press. And we worked together to get the book published. Um, so Catherine wrote a foreword to the book. And um, we were also able to obtain um, an afterword by Cecil Roberts, uh, the current president of the UMWA, who wrote a phenomenal <laughs> afterward. And uh, one of the great stories there is that I had interviewed his grandmother. So one of the uh, persons profiled in the book whose, whose interview I did was uh, Lena Blizzard Harlow, his grandmother. So he connected with the book personally. Uh, and I was really thrilled with that. So, so that's the story of how it came to be published. And uh, I could not be more appreciative to Catherine and to all of you who helped make that possible. Yeah, it was perfect timing. I feel like Kat also <laughs> sent me an email when you reached out and was like, look who just you know, <laughs> emailed in. And I yeah. didn't know about the project uh -huh. previously. And yeah. Uh -huh. Folks who are listening, you can pick up that book at the museum, we dropped the link in the comments. So if you want to grab it, it is phenomenal. Um, I, and so this was 50 years ago, long yeah. before social media yeah. email ever came into play. How, how did you identify the people that you were going to talk to? Well, that's a good question. Uh, there was no social media, no email, no computers, uh, no cell phones. <laughs> and, uh, I, I made my initial contacts through the Miners of Democracy, which had hired me and brought me down there. Um, I also through the Black Lung Association, um, I made some connections through VISTA. Uh, I know your staff member, Kirsten, has worked for VISTA. Um, and uh, I, I knew some academics in the area. 
but basically once I got going, once I got into the field, um, one thing led to another. So I would talk to someone and they'd say, you've got to talk to Ernest Blankenship. And I'd talk to someone else and they'd say, you've got to talk to Josh Chafin. And I just, um, after my initial contacts, I really didn't use them anymore. I just got out there and started meeting people. Were there any folks who were hesitant to speak to you or, or wouldn't speak at all? Uh, yes, there were some. Uh, I did not try to talk to people who didn't want to talk about it. Um, I did not record people who did not want to be recorded. Uh, a few people wanted their names changed, which I did for them. But most people were willing to talk. And uh, my experience is that many older adults love to be asked about their life experiences. They really appreciate it, particularly when a young person comes along and says, you know, I think you did something important. Um, I'd like to listen to your stories. And um, so most people did did talk with me. Um, you know, I'm barely five feet tall. I don't think I was too threatening. Uh, I think I, I they sort of related to me more as a granddaughter than somebody who was going to get them into trouble. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you're traveling the hills and hollers of West Virginia before GPS as well. What kind <laughs> of what kind of <laughs> geographical ground did you cover when you were here? Well, I, I spent most of my time in southern West Virginia, um, but I also went into eastern Kentucky and southwestern Virginia. Um, the book that was published is just the West Virginia interviews, so there. Are sections of my work which have not yet been published um, that came out of Kentucky and and the very southwestern portion of the state of Virginia. <clears throat> and I will say I got lost a lot. Uh, I used maps constantly, uh, but they often didn't do much good. I, I grew up in an urban area and um, I was used to streets that you know crossed on right angles <laughs> and uh, that's not the way most roads work in West Virginia where they follow the course of rivers or mountains and um, so I learned to use geographic uh, I learned to navigate by river and tree and holler and all those things and not, yeah. not so much uh, crisscross roads um, but yeah I made my way around yeah, that's definitely a thing. You go by landmarks or by landmarks, <laughs> right? I, I had one guy. I got stuck in a ditch one time and had to find a guy with a tractor to haul me out. And I mean, I had some adventures, but nothing nothing terrible happened. Good. I, could you speak about some of the most memorable interviews? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, there were many. Uh, I loved talking to Grace Jackson. Uh, she was a Miner's widow who lived on Cabin Creek in Eskdale. I, I actually connected with her through Vista because she was participating that time in a quilt making cooperative that Vista had helped organize. And she had participated in the strikes on Cabin Creek in 1912 and 13 when she was a child. And she had vivid memories of them. She remembered Mother Jones. And there, there, you know, I don't, there's nobody alive anymore who remembers Mother Jones. And there weren't too many people then who remembered Mother Jones. So she was very special. Um, I interviewed a guy named Clay Petrie, who uh, was a teenager during the Miners' March. He was a he was already working in the mines. He was a union miner. Uh, he was the younger brother of. Bill Petrie, who later became an officer of District 17 of the UMW. And he recalled riding on the train, the CNO train that the miners commandeered from the depot in Clothier, West Virginia, to carry men and supplies back and forth to the battle area. So that was quite remarkable. I, I actually have an audio clip from that interview that I was hoping to play uh if um kirsten if you could help pull up the slides for me i have a i think we could play that <clears throat> so this is the uh, cover of the book um oh and by the way uh, kenzie did pitch the book 
but all royalties from the sale of the book are going directly to the museum. So if you buy a copy, it's for a good cause. So um, let's, I'm gonna go to the next slide because it, uh, it shows the um, section from the interview with Clay Petrie that I'd like to play if, um, it's a little hard sometimes to understand um, these tapes. The audio quality is not that great. So I've prepared a um, transcript here so you can follow along. And this is where Clay Petrie is talking about how the miners mobilized to march down to the battle site um, where the Battle of Blair Mountain was fought. And they talk. he talks here about how they mobilized and how they took over the CNO train. So, Kirsten, could you help us, or Kinsey, could you help it was with the audio? Mobilized. I, I guess in the head of Little Cold River from Clothier, around uh, from Clothier through Memphis and Jeffrey, and uh, and on into Sharpus and Beach, and uh, on into uh, Blair and uh, Sovereign. I guess they was six or seven, maybe eight hundred thousand men in there, with, armed with all kind of uh, farm equipment. Right. So uh, to get these men in there, they took a CNO railroad the engine away from. Uh, they didn't take it; they just took it over. You see, they used to the CNO railroad company used to have uh, local freights come up this river, and they would lay over at Clothier. That was the end of a run uh, from St. Albans to Clothier. They would lay over there and return back the next morning, the next day. So they got in there, they took over an engine, an engine crew, conductor and brakeman, the whole engine crew, the miners did. And they run that engine up and down these rivers. Now, and now this, I got a question. Did they, uh, did the train's crew come over to their side and run it for them, or the miners actually took over the jobs themselves? No, the train crew. They took over the train crew and run a runner ahead of this engine, ahead of this train crew. They took a, a gasoline section car, like the section men used to ride, the, the crews that used to repair the track. Mm -hmm. They took that. Well, they was about six or eight uh, men rode that uh, section car, it's a gasoline section car, one of these gasoline jobs. There were about six or eight men on that thing with high-powered rifles and pistol on them. And they run ahead of this engine. Mm -hmm. they, they run ahead of it. That was the forerunner of it. And then this engine come behind with box cars and flat cars hauling men and provisions, picking up men and provisions, food provisions, all along. And hauling up in that river, up in the head of Little Cold River, in the edge of Logan County. See, Logan County comes through. Uh, Clothier is on the line between Boone and uh, Logan. Mm -hmm. Clothier is on the line, and then it goes on across, then over on the Tug, over around Chapmansville. That's pretty close to on the line. Chapmansville, I think, is over in the Logan County line. It's under Logan County, but it's close to the line. The line runs across there, They're cutting off the rivers, you know, heading through. And uh, they they haul the men and supplies in there. I rode it myself. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there was quite a few men in there, and there was quite a few things that went on. There was a lot of doing around and doing about. I want you to know. It wasn't in there. It wasn't no cat buster parade. It wasn't no bunch of kids playing cowboy and Indian either. They, they was in there for bed. Uh, thanks for playing that. Um, I, I must say I was astonished by that story. And I asked him the question about, you know, did the train crew take it over? Because I, I what happened, in fact, was the, the miners, um, uh, the miners put a gun to the head of the engineer. The engineer was, the train was stopped overnight at the Clothier Depot and the engineer was sleeping in his boarding house. And the miners went in there and put a gun to his head and said, you're getting back down to the depot and you're going to run the train up and down the track for us. So uh, 
it uh they they got the trans crew uh under under gun to do what they wanted um but it clay petri was a delightful uh interview um subject um I love it how he says uh, wasn't a bunch of kids playing cowboys and Indians. Um, we it was in there for business. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't no cap buster parade either. <laughs> yeah, no cap buster parade. <laughs> this this uh, event in particular was, you know, the subject of many many conversations that we had in Clothier um, amongst ourselves when we were putting together the monuments and the um, public installations there. Thank you so much for for sharing this. Yes, um, I see we have a comment here as a Logan County native and geography professor. I love the geographic descriptions. Yeah, they're really quite, quite wonderful. Um, I was learning a lot from hearing them. Uh, let me mention just a couple other interviews. I don't have quotes from them here, but uh, many of you who follow this history know about a particularly well-known incident um, that occurred on Blair Mountain when a group of deputy sheriffs confronted a group of armed miners um, under the leadership of Reverend um, J.E. Wilburn. And there was an uh, exchange of shots and uh, Ch Sheriff Chapin's chief deputy, John Gore, was killed and a, two other deputies with him. And an African-American union miner named Eli Kemp, was, who was in Wilburn's party, was shot and killed. Um, I interviewed John Wilburn, who was J.E. Wilburn's son, he was part of the Miners Party there, and he was probably the one who shot Gore. And I interviewed Albert Gore, who was John Gore's son, who had heard about what happened on the mountain from someone who was with his father. So I, I basically interviewed persons who witnessed a fatal confrontation on either end of the gun barrel, which was mind blowing to me at the time and still kind of amazing to me. Awesome. So if, if any of you are interested in hearing more of these tapes, I gave a talk um, recently for George Washington University for their labor history collection and played quite a few of the audio clips during that talk. And um, I think Kenzie will share a link to that presentation in the chat. Um, so you're welcome to go listen to that. Um, and some of them now have been digitized and are available online through the GW collection. They're still in the process of processing them, so not all of the interviews are up there. I have them all, but they aren't all yet available to the public. Wonderful. We'll drop a link to that collection too so that folks can, can That's access. great. Yeah, yeah, terrific. So you came back to West Virginia just a couple years ago for the Blair Mountain Centennial. Was this the first time that you'd been back since 1972? Actually, it was. And it was very emotional for me. Um, I was thrilled to be back. Uh, the project had meant a lot to me and I was um, very happy to be invited back. Um, I was on a panel at Taylor Books. Uh, Catherine Moore chaired it and um, uh, Ginny Ayers um, and Chuck Keeney also spoke about their books. I spoke about On Dark and Bloody Ground. Uh, a number of my former colleagues from the Miners for Democracy showed up. Some of them had not been back for 50 years. Um, and then we uh, rented cars, went down to make one to visit the museum. And um, you will know this, and many of your listeners will know this, but there was a temporary um, exhibit that was put up along the route of the Miners March with, with signage. And we followed along to see all of those signs. And I got so inspired by that, that I wanted to do a new research project. So I, I'm currently doing new research <laughs> and uh, I've been back to West Virginia several times to do research now. So I, I was a professor for 30 years and uh, I'm retired. <laughs> so I can, I can work on research that interests me right now. So uh, I, I've got a new project going. Yeah, I want to, I think we should dig in. Um, so, you know, first I wanted, I wanted you to kind of set the scene for folks who are listening, because we're going to be talking about Clothier. Uh -huh. um, and the museum's latest project, Courage in the Hollers, was really an offshoot from Blair Footsteps, these temporary uh -huh. um, installations that you, you referenced. 
Mm-hmm. And so for folks who don't know, the museum spent the last year um, working with communities, both in Marmette and Clothier on uh, designing and curating monuments that are dedicated to the Miner's March and to the story of Blair Mountain. So when Anne was here in 1972, there were no markers, there were no monuments, there were really no public discussions about the miners. And so we really wanted to regenerate conversations and, and regenerate these bonds within communities. So could you talk a little bit about why, why is Clothier important um, for the story of the mine wars? I know we kind of got to that with Petrie's interview, but um, could you speak on it a little bit more? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And um, if you'd be kind enough to bring my slides up, I have a few slides to show on my new research uh, for your listeners. Um, so my new project involves learning more about William J. Clothier, who was the founder and president of the Boone County Coal Corporation, which owned much of the land on which the Battle of Blair Mountain was fought. Uh, When I was back uh, in 2021, one of the Blair Footsteps um, posters or signs that uh, we came across, I, I believe Kyle, is his name Kyle Warnock? Uh, Kyle Warnock. Warmack. He had, I believe, designed this sign. And it was it was actually this photograph of William Clothier and just said a few words about his company. And I thought, yeah, I'm really interested in that. I, I, I've got to know more about it. And let me just say a little bit more about why I was particularly interested in him. Um, I was a student at Swarthmore College when I, as I had mentioned, um, this is this building is cl- called Clothier Hall. It's the largest building on the Swarthmore College campus. Um, I had been part of the modern dance troupe at Swarthmore College. I'd performed there. I mean, I was I was quite attached to this building, and um, this building, which I knew being a student there, it was named for a man named Isaac Clothier, who was a Philadelphia. Quaker who founded a major department store called Strawbridge and Clothier. And he became very wealthy um, as a result of running these department stores. Um, And his, he had also been very involved with Swarthmore College. He had served on the board of trustees for many years and all nine of his children went to Swarthmore College. Um, And his family had donated the money for the construction of this building in the 1920s. So I, I knew that when I got to West Virginia, and then I got to West Virginia, and I quite soon encountered the town of Clothier, which was near the Bear, Blair Mountain battle site, and I, I drove through Clothier many times. I had I done interviews there, and um, when I first saw that name, Clothier, as a town, I thought, that's surprising. Um, it's not a common name. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence, but then I thought it's not a common name. Maybe there's some connection. Well, it turns out that the town of Clothier was named for William Clothier, the coal operator, who was the son of Isaac Clothier, (laughs) the department store founder in Philadelphia. So there was a direct link there. And um, that struck me as something interesting to explore. So let me just share a few other slides and kind of get into some of the questions I'm trying to ask with my current research, um, not all of which I've answered yet. Um, But William Clothier founded the Boone County Coal Corporation in 1911. He was just 29 years old. Um, He had graduated from Harvard College. Uh, He went to Swarthmore and he transferred to Harvard. He graduated from Harvard College. His father asked him if he wanted to go into the department store business. And he said, no, he wasn't interested in it. So his father gave him some money and said, start your own business. And he decided he wanted to start a coal company. And he founded a company, which um, I'm going to ask you if you can see my cursor. Maybe not. Okay, so his, um, you can see in this map, which is taken from my book, Um, The thumbnail on the upper left shows where in West Virginia this rectangle is drawn from. And Clothier's company was at the very southwest corner of the Kanawha coal field when it kind of 
goes over into Logan County. Why he called his company the Boone County Coal Corporation, I have no idea because it was in Logan County. But if you read about the coal fields at that time, they'll say Logan, the Logan coal field in 1921 was entirely non-union except for about 5%. That 5% was William Clothier's company that was actually in the Kanawha coal field. So let me, um, this is a map I've created. It's an original map. Um, it grows out of my current research. And I developed it with the assistance of a professional graphic designer who happens to be my daughter and a professional geographer who happens to be her father-in-law. So uh, well, there was a bit of family um, effort involved in creating this map. What we did to create this map was we overlay several layers. So what you're seeing here is a contemporary GPS accurate topographical map, which you can see the little mountain ridges. Um, we're looking at the National Register of Historic Places official Battle of Blair Mountain battleground, which appears as kind of the red jagged line along the Blair Mountain Ridge. And you're seeing the perimeter of the Boone County Coal Corporation, which was Clothier's company, which we took from a 1915 map that appeared in the Library of Congress. It's a vintage historic map that was developed by coal mine engineers at that time. So I believe that this map for the first time really definitively shows uh, the relationship between Clothier's company and the historic events that we've come to know as the Battle of Blair Mountain. And you can also see from the map that Clothier had essentially bought up the watershed of the Little Coal River. And he founded the town of Clothier at the northern end of his property. And then you can see the Little Coal River and its various creeks that fed into it uh, all the way down to the um, the creeks at the very tip of the of the watershed there. So he he had bought up a, essentially a, a coherent geological area. So um, let me move on from this map, and I'm going to return to it in a moment and say a little bit more about it. <clears throat> so he founded his company in 1911. Um, the timing was fortuitous because the CNO Railroad had just come in the year before, and had run a rail line from the first time south down into that portion of the West Virginia coal fields. So I've marked this with an orange marker so you can kind of see what they built out in 1910. The line ran from St. Albans um, to Sproul to a place called Horse Creek Junction, and I, I don't actually know where that is. And then this map is crooked, so the line is actually running mostly south, but uh, then it goes down to Clothier and um, Sharples, Blair, Kelly, and then has what they called special purpose spurs that ran out on either side up hollows that were then developed um, for coal mines. And I found this, um, this is a, a railroad guide um, that uh, an organization called Rail Fan Guides, they, they uh, it's the, you know, fans of railroading have these great old historic maps that show how these uh, railroads got built out. So when I got interested in learning more about Clothier's company, I came back to West Virginia. I went to the West Virginia Regional History Center in Morgantown, with the, where the university is located, WVU. And I started digging around among old maps and documents to try to figure out how this region was developed at this period. So this is a this is a, a photograph I took of a 1910 map. Uh, I was sitting in the reading room of the library. I had my iPad to photograph things, and I was using my pencil, which happened to be pink, uh, to leave <laughs> to point at the things I wanted to photograph. So that's what well, you're seeing a pencil here. Um, this was a 1910 map, and you can see that almost no communities. Um, 
existed along the um, Little Coal River. Um, and you can see on the map the boundary between Boone and Logan counties. It's a dotted line, and you can see the CNO line coming down the um, Spruce Fork of the Little Coal River. But there's basically nothing there in 1910. One of the interesting things about this particular map is it was developed by the and for the timber interests. So the dark green areas show uncut timber, virgin timber. The crosshatched green areas show areas that had been logged. So the timber companies had already come through this area and had logged significant tracts of land, but it had not yet for the most part been mined. So uh, clothing was basically coming into area that had been, at least parts of it had been denuded of trees by the timber industry. Uh, and he was buying up this land to develop um, a coal industry. Um, I was looking for old uh, land sale records and they, it was frustrating because I did find some, they, they were incomplete. But this is an example of a document that was a contract of sale uh, involving a sale of land. Uh, you can see the Boone County Coal Corporation is mentioned there. And it, these land contracts at that time are these detailed multi-page documents where they basically describe each tree. Uh, and the, the perimeter of the properties is described in terms of uh, going from one tree to another. So Clothier was, uh, you know, by 1911, he was down in this area. He was buying up land, probably from the timber companies uh, that had already been through. So here's a 1914 map. So it was just um, three years after he had founded his company. And you can see that um, he's begun to build out uh, towns, uh, coal camps along the Little Coal River. Um, you can see again the boundary between Boone and Cole counties. You can see he's built the town of Clothier. Uh, you can see the little towns of Benda, Dobra, Sharples, and Sovereign. So he is beginning to build out the infrastructure uh, for his uh, coal company. Uh, this was another uh, interesting find. This is from an old uh, vintage newspaper. Uh, called the West Virginian. Uh, this is just a little story. You, you can't read it, but that's what the page looks like. Um, this old microfiche now has mostly been digitized and is searchable. Um, this uh, story in 1918 says that the Boone County Coal Corporation had purchased 20,000 acres in Logan County. Um, the purchase included 12 small mining operations known as the Sylvia Mines, employing 70 men. Uh, the price was $250,000. Uh, the buyer was William J. Clothier. So he was essentially piecing together his company over a period of several years from land sales and sales of existing small mines in the area. Uh, this is a historic photo of Blair, West Virginia that I got actually from the museum. Uh, this was one of his coal camps. Um, he had a mine in Blair or near Blair, the um, number 12 mine. So by 1919, his company had assembled a track of about 32,000 acres, about 50 square miles of uh, bituminous coal bearing land, uh, mostly in Logan County, a little bit in Boone County. Uh, it was very rich coal land. Uh, and he had begun building mines, processing facilities, worker housing, schools, churches, stores, and post offices. Um, if you look at this uh, image, I, I'd love to have someone tell me exactly what I'm looking at there, but I, I appear to be looking at uh, a rail depot, uh, what might be a company store, a boarding house, uh, and then miners' homes all built along the tracks. And this was the CNO line that um, had just recently been built into that area. Um, I want to just pause for a moment and ask Kenzie if um, everybody's hearing me okay. Uh, you aren't, I don't see you anymore, so I just want to make sure that everything's good on your end. Okay, so now we're getting to a 1921 map. Uh, this shows that yet more coal camps have sprouted up 
Uh, he's built a new one at Montclo on Beach Creek, Mifflin also on Beach Creek, uh, McNear, Spruce Valley, Ardrossan on Beach Creek, and, and Blair, which we just saw a photograph of. So you, you really, through these maps, you get a feeling for a very rapid transformation of this area as it was industrialized by, I'm going to call it outside capital. This was not a local business person. This was um, a out of town, wealthy individual from Philadelphia who had inherited money and who was um, building a coal company. <clears throat> By the way, William Clothier never lived in the coal fields. Um, he lived his entire life uh, near Philadelphia, and he hired professional managers to operate his mines for him. So how did he name his coal camps? This is just a little aside, but I got curious about where he came up with the names for the towns he built during that period. Uh, and I was particularly interested in the name Blair because, of course, it's the Battle of Blair Mountain. There, There is a Blair Mountain. You know, where did the name Blair come from? Well, I'm pretty sure that Blair was named by Clothier after an associate of his, um, the Philadelphia banker whose name was C. Ledyard Blair. That's a picture of him. He was the grandson of the railroad magnate, uh, John Inslee Blair, who was one of the 19th century's wealthiest men. He was a Gilded Age railroad baron. And um, this man here, C. Ledyard Blair, was a founder of Blair and Company, a banking firm uh, that invested his family's wealth uh, in railroads, oil, and other assets. Um, he also served as a governor of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, Sharples, another town that you'll be familiar with from West Virginia. Um, it was probably named for the Sharples family, who were wealthy Philadelphia Quaker industrialists from the turn of the century who made a fortune selling cream separators. That was just a little personal side. The Sharples family was also very involved with Swarthmore College. They were, uh, they were, um, benefactors of Swarthmore. And when I was a student there, I took my meals in the dining hall, which was called Sharples Hall. So that was another one of these, where does this, where does this come from? What's the connection? Uh, Ardrossan no longer exists. It's at the very head of Beach Creek. And I think most of Beach Creek has now been destroyed by overburden from surface mining operations. And people who live there can tell me if that's accurate. But at the very head of Beach Creek was a, a coal town called Ardrossan. Uh, it was likely named after the estate of, that is the big house of Clothier's business partner, the investment banker, Robert L. Montgomery. The, uh, the movie Philadelphia Story was said to have been set at Ardrossan. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the map again. Uh, this is the same map and it's got one more layer on it. So we took the map that I showed you earlier, and we laid on top of it the lines of march of the two sides in the Battle of Blair Mountain. So the green arrows show the lines of march of the Union miners. The light purple lines with the arrowhead show the lines of march of the Logan County defenders over the five days or so of fighting during the Battle of Blair Mountain. So that's taking historic data and laying it on top of um, laying it on top of the earlier map. So what you can see from that map is that we, you know, I've sort of set up the situation where we have William Clothier. He's by this time in his 30s, but he's a young man. He's built out this significant coal company. He's got 13 mines operating by this time, and uh, over a 50 square mile area and his property suddenly becomes ground zero in the biggest civil insurrection in the United States since the Civil War. And now some of the Union miners came down Hewitt Creek, which is to the north, and that didn't cross his property, but a lot of them came down the Little Coal River and then went up Beach Creek or went 
through Blair and then up the mountain. And they were they were on his land. So the the question <laughs> that I'm trying to explore in this new piece of research is what did he think about all of this? What was his role? What was his attitude about it? What did he do or not do? Uh, this photograph here, you'll recall when we listened to the interview with Clay Petrie, he talked about the commandeered CNO train. This is, I believe, the only extant photograph we have of that. It's a very precious historic photo um, of the CNO train that had been commandeered, and you can see the armed miners riding on top of the boxcars and on the flat cars. Um, I believe that this photograph was taken in Ramage, which is just a little bit north of Clothier. But um, this shows what what it would have liked, looked like from the point of view of the miners who worked for Clothier and, and the managers of his company. This may have been one of his company housing in the background of this photo. So I want to leave you with this kind of open question, and I, I want to try to intrigue you with this question. And uh, I, I'm going to just give you a couple clues about what Clothier might have thought. The first clue is that he was a devout Quaker. Um, this is a picture of the meeting house where he worshipped in Wayne, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. Um, he was described by contemporaries as being a devout man. He used the what Quakers would call the simple language, thee and thou, the pronouns thee and thou throughout his life. Uh, this is particularly interesting to me because I was myself raised as a Quaker. I attended Quaker meeting uh, as a teenager. Uh, when I came to West, I, I haven't been an actively practicing Quaker for many years, but I was when I came to West Virginia, I, I strongly identified with the Quaker faith. And Quakers believe um, that war and conflict are against God's will, and they're dedicated to pacifism and nonviolence. So this is a pacifistic religion. He was presumably a pacifist, and his land is now the site of a shooting war. The other interesting fact about uh, William Clothier is that his mines were unionized. They were the only mines in Logan County that were unionized at that time. And his company and his managers were participants in the Kanawha Coal Operators Association, which at that time had a contract with the United Mine Workers of America. And um, so he was operating union mines. So the 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 miners who marched on Blair Mountain, their dispute was not with Clothier. Their dispute, of course, was with the non-union operators. But his company was involved to the extent that much of the military operations were taking place on land that he owned. So I'm going to leave you there with um, these kind of two clues. And we're just going to leave it as an open question what he was doing and what he was thinking. And thank you so much um, for this rich presentation. We do have at least one question from the audience that um, I'm going to display up on the, the screen. How divisive were the interviews and the interviewees? Were they equally on both sides of the conflict or was one more predominant? Were people still hostile toward the different Oh, that's a great question. I made a real effort when I was there to try to interview people on both sides of the conflict. But most of the people I interviewed were retired miners and were had been union members and were sympathetic to the union side in that dispute. Um, I did interview one man who had been a mine boss in Logan County, um, and he gave me a perspective there. I, I interviewed a woman who told a fascinating story about how two of her brothers were on opposite sides in the conflict and how it basically broke up their family. So um, I made an effort, but I think if you read the book, you'll see that most of the interviews reflect a, a pro-union perspective. Are there any other questions from the audience? We've got a couple of minutes left. 
So if you have one, please drop it in the chat. While we're waiting, I do want to give a pitch. If you are watching this, we have dropped a survey in the comments. Um, please take the time to fill out the survey, three minutes or less, and it really goes a long way in helping us better the programming at the museum. Not just Mind Wars Forum, but other education programs. Kenzie, perhaps you could also make sure that people have a link to um, or information about how to purchase the book if they're interested and also how they could access the uh, digitized recordings at um, George Washington. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hi, Jenny. Nice, nice for you to be here. Um, <clears throat> Here's one from Ethan Carnes. Was the original NEH grant specifically for Mind Wars Oral History? It was. That was what the grant was for. It was It was broadly for uh, the unionization of the central Appalachian coal fields in the 1920s and 30s. So it had a somewhat broader mandate, but I spent most of my time tracking down um, witnesses or participants to the Battle of Blair Mountain. Yeah, yeah. Go, G, go GW. It, they, they have a, a very... Uh, good labor history collection there uh, that's actually funded by the Teamsters Union, but has uh, a bunch of unions uh, materials there. Yeah. Hey, Ethan. Ethan worked with the museum during the Battle of Blair Mountain Centennial too, and, and Great. online exhibit. Um, here's one. What did you think <laughs> about West Virginia, its people, and its culture coming from an urban area into very remote areas for the first time? People were incredibly kind and welcoming to me. And I, you know, approached strangers in a way I would not have felt comfortable approaching strangers in an urban area. I felt immediately comfortable. So, yeah, I, I, I loved it. Did you feel just as comfortable coming back in 2021? Uh, I did. People are very welcoming. Uh -huh. Very hospitable culture. Yeah. Well, I want to end by saying thank you. Thank you, Anne, for your time tonight. And thank you for your work. I mean, truly, the museum stands on the shoulders of people like you who really just laid out a beautiful foundation. The, the Mind Wars Museum isn't the first to participate in public history work surrounding Mind Wars history. And I hope that we're not the last. Um, Okay. And I just want to say thank you for, for all that you've done, truly. You're very welcome, Kenzie, and thank you for all the great work that you do. Maybe you can invite me back in a few months and I'll do a next um, episode of this serial of the uh, Clothier Company and its history. Yeah, yeah. I want to say thanks also <coughs> to our listeners who stuck with us tonight. We're so glad to have your company. Um, this presentation will be available later. Uh, you can use the same link. Visit our Facebook and YouTube page and you can find it there. I want to say thanks again to the West Virginia Humanities Council for their support in this programming. I want to say thank you to our museum members who support literally every inch of the museum's work. We could not do it without you. Um, and if you're not a member yet, we will drop a link in the chat so that you can sign up and support people's history. Also want to say thanks to my colleague, Kirsten Eaton. You cannot see her tonight, but she has been behind the scenes and making magic happen. Um, we couldn't do this without her. And um, also a final reminder to please fill out that, ev that evaluation survey in the uh, comments below. It, it truly, truly goes a long way. You can keep up with the museum on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and most recently, TikTok. And you can also sign up for our monthly e-newsletter at wvmindwars.org. We hope to see y'all next week, same day, same time, for our final episode of the 2023 season. And until then, good night, everyone. <laughs>